Uh, so one of the joys of being a pastor is getting a front row seat in significant moments in people's lives, and weddings are one of those moments. Over the course of this spring, I did probably more weddings uh, in one spring than I've ever done. I think I had like five within like a seven-week stretch. It was like every time I was turning around, I was doing another wedding. Um, and, and weddings are, are a really unique moment to see two people's lives get joined together. They become one. There's so much ceremony around it. There's so much pomp and circumstance. It's just like a really exciting moment. And one of my favorite moments of a wedding ceremony is the moment the bride walks in the aisle. I mean, obviously, there's like kind of the buildup to that moment. You get a clear view of her coming in. But my favorite thing about that moment isn't so much walking, watching her walk in, but it's looking at the groom in that moment. Because when the bride comes in and everybody just naturally stands, where does everybody look? They look to the bride. But what's really interesting is looking at the groom and watching like all of the emotion. I can't tell you how many times I've seen grooms just like, like really strong, tough guys. And they see their wife walk in and they just like, or oh, a puddle of a, an emotional mess. Um, during first service, I obviously said the same thing. And a guy who was here first service sent me a picture of his wedding day. I did his wedding this spring. And the picture was of me and him. And I'm looking at him in this picture. <laughs> The only other person who looks at the groom in that moment is who? The groom's mom, right? Because everybody's looking there, and she's looking back like, is he doing okay? Is he going to make it? Now, in a wedding, an entrance like that communicates something about the moment as well as the individual, i.e., the bride, who's making the entrance, and what it communicates is that she is the focal point of the ceremony. Because the groom typically enters from the side. It's very subtle. It's very discreet. But the bride has all of this pomp and circumstance. She has a grand march. She has a processional. There are her bridesmaids, little cute girls throwing flowers around, a little young guy in a tux with a pillow with a ring on it, sometimes a dog with a pillow with a ring on it. I've seen that. I've seen all kinds of things. And then the doors close. She gets her own special song. There's this like dramatic gesture of doors opening, and then she walks in. It's the focal point, and it's like the buildup to that moment. It's like, ah, I can't wait for it. Now, there's another guy, though, who was not to be outdone by his bride having her entrance and wanted an entrance of his own and did this at his wedding. Take a look. Talk about an entrance, right? 
I mean, it took him two minutes to cover a distance that probably should have taken him like 15 seconds. Now, entrances in moments like that communicate something both about the individual who's entering and the moment itself. And so the question with that is like, what does that communicate about who this guy is. I mean, is he that insecure that he can't have his wife like outdo him on their wedding day? Does he have to be the center of attention? Is he an egomaniac who's like, everybody's got to look at me? Well, when you find that video on YouTube, you find that both he and his wife are YouTube dancers and choreographers. Like that's what they do. They dance, they choreograph dances, they choreographed their entire wedding. Like meaning not only just their entrance there, but when you go to the, the, ser- the reception and the bridal party enters, they choreographed that. They choreographed their first dance together. They had a dance-off challenge between the bridal parties. I mean, the whole thing was choreographed. It communicates something about who they are in that that's what they do. Now, we're at this point in John's gospel where Jesus makes a very significant entrance of his own. He's making an entrance into Jerusalem, and it will actually be the last time he enters into Jerusalem. And as he enters in, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of fanfare, but the way he enters in is wildly significant. And it says something about who he is and what he's all about in the moment that he's entering into. And so for us, the question surfaces is what does, in, what does Jesus' entrance say about him, and then what does it mean for us? Because all the people who are there when he enters like, are engaged in the moment, but what does that entrance say about him? What does it say about the people who are there? But even more importantly, what does it mean for us? And this is how our passage begins. This is John chapter 12 starting in verse 12. It says, The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Now, the festival that's mentioned here is the Passover festival. Uh, We're told at the beginning of chapter 12 that it was just a few days away. And so the Passover sets the context for Jesus' entrance. And if we remember, the Passover celebrates God's redemption of his people in slavery in Egypt thousands of years ago. So the Passover was this massive deal, and it would draw Jews from all over Israel and the surrounding areas to come to Jerusalem to celebrate God redeeming his people. And in verse 12, we're told that there's a great crowd present for the festival, and among this crowd, there's a lot of hype about Jesus. The reason being is that word is spreading about what Jesus did in the previous chapter, in chapter 11, with raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, we don't know how much time has, has kind of spanned from when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and his entrance into Jerusalem. It could be a few weeks, <clears throat> maybe it's month, a month, but whatever the case is, this one event of raising Lazarus has kind of overshadowed everything else that's been happening in John's gospel. Because as you read through the, second, the last part of chapter 11 into the beginning of chapter 12, it's the event that's still being discussed. Meaning, in the previous story, the beginning of chapter 12, Jesus is in Bethany. That, that's the town where Lazarus lives. That's where Lazarus was buried. And the reason he's in Bethany is he's on his way to Jerusalem. He makes a stop there. But while in Bethany, Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, throw a dinner party for Jesus in honor of Jesus raising their brother from the dead. And what we're told is that when Jesus gets to Bethany even and people hear that he's there, there's all of this hype about Jesus in Bethany to the point that crowds come and crash the dinner party that Lazarus, Mary, and Martha are throwing for Jesus, and we're told that many people believe. So what John is doing as he moves from the end of the last story into this passage is he's starting to build anticipation for Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. Because this story today is, again, preceded by the story of a crowd crashing this dinner party, and then the way that John writes this next part is he's kind of insinuating that this crowd that came around Jesus at Bethany is also following him 
to Jerusalem. Now, the distance between Bethany and Jerusalem would be less than two miles, we're told. It's roughly the distance between Meadowbrook Church and State Fairgrounds. I mean, less than two miles. You could walk there in 30 minutes. These two towns are right next to each other. So John is writing this moment, insinuating that there's this great crowd of people who've crashed this dinner party, who's, who are overly excited about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. They know he's going to Jerusalem, and then they follow him to Jerusalem. And we read in verse 12 that there's already a great crowd of people in Jerusalem there for the Passover. And then if we jump ahead to the end of this passage in verse 17, we read, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread word. Meaning they they probably went ahead of him to Jerusalem and said, hey, Jesus is coming. He did this to Lazarus. Lazarus is with him. Lazarus is coming. And then we read in verse 18, many people, because they heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So Jesus is already bringing a great crowd of people from Bethany to Jerusalem. There's already a great crowd of people in Jerusalem because they're there for the Passover. And now this great crowd is getting word of Jesus on his way and what he's done to Lazarus, and they go out to meet him. So that means as Jesus is walking into Jerusalem, I mean, people around that city are just going bananas about Jesus being in town. And he's about to make the biggest entrance into Jerusalem of his life. And we read in verse 13, they took palm branches, and went out to meet him. So as Jesus enters to to Jerusalem, there's this massive crowd of people waving palm branches. Now, if we're familiar with this story, we probably take these palm branches for granted, and we probably think of them like cheerleader pom-poms, right? They're this celebratory accessory that's just used to kind of like pump up the crowd and participate in the moment and wave something in the air for celebration and just say, yay, 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 go Jesus, go. But in reality, in the first century Jewish world, palm branches carried a loaded significance. Like they had loaded meaning to them. It wasn't just, hey, we need to wave something for a celebration. They were something that communicated something significant. And part of the meaning of palm branches started to surface during the intertestamental period in Jewish culture. So the intertestamental period would be that time in history between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. Roughly 400 years, that's not recorded in the Bible, span between the Old and New Testament. And during part of that time, the Greek Empire was the global superpower of the day, and they occupied Israel and occupied Jerusalem. And one of the things they did in Jerusalem was that they banned all Jewish religious practice in the temple in Jerusalem. They they basically kicked everybody out of the temple who would have been working in the temple as a priest or a musician and said, you are no longer allowed to worship your God in this temple. In turn, they brought pagan worship into the temple and erected statues of Greek gods in the temple. So if you walked into the temple, this was around 170 AD or 170 BC, you would see statues of, um, of Zeus and Hermes and Aphrodite. You'd see all of these Greek gods in the temple that was supposed to be dedicated to Yahweh. Now there was a priest by the name of Judas Maccabee. He was a, a Jewish priest and he recruited a group of people, kind of like this under, underground guerrilla army to fight back against the Greeks, to basically take back the temple and take back Jerusalem. And in uh, 164 AD, they did that. They marched into Jerusalem, they pushed the Greeks out, and they reclaimed the temple. When they marched into the city, they were waving palm branches. It became a symbol of their freedom and their independence. You see the same symbol surface in 70 AD, so roughly um, 40 years after Jesus walked the earth, because if Greek was occupying Jerusalem before Jesus, who's the global superpower that's occupying Jerusalem during the time of Jesus? It's the Romans. And so 
about 40 years after Jesus left the earth, there was again another power struggle between the Jews and the Romans, and they minted coins during this revolutionary period that had a palm branch on the coin. So a palm branch became a national symbol for the Jewish people of freedom and independence. And so when Jesus rides into Jerusalem and people are waving palm branches, it's not just, hey, we need a pom-pom, some sort of celebratory accessory. They're making a statement about what they hope is going to happen with this guy. And in addition to waving palm branches, as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, we see that they are saying this. Um, This is, again, keep going in verse 13. It says, Hosanna. They're shouting, Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. So not only are they waving palm branches, but they are shouting Hosanna, which is a term that means save us now. So they're waving palm branches saying, save us now. Save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us now. You are the king of Israel. Not only are they shouting, save us now, but they're declaring that Jesus is the rightful king of Israel, with Jerusalem being the capital. So when you put all of this together, and Jesus is entering into Jerusalem, it kind of feels like the crowds are expecting a revolution. That what they're hoping is that as they enter into Jerusalem, they will storm the capital, they will remove Herod from leadership, they will post their flag, and they will establish God's kingdom once and for all. And it will be, as it says in the Old Testament, an eternal kingdom that will never, ever end. Now, what's interesting about this moment is if that's what the crowds are saying, like how does Jesus respond? What, like what's his reaction to all of this? And what you see is that Jesus receives everything they're saying. Like Jesus receives that they are declaring him king. He's stepping into this moment, not resisting the declaration that he's king, but welcoming it. There, there is another place in John's gospel where Jesus is declared king, or they say of Jesus, let's make this guy our king, and he does resist. It's John 6. After Jesus feeds 5,000 people with two fish and five loaves of bread, everybody has everything they want to eat. There's 12 baskets of food left over. The response of the crowd in that moment is, my gosh, this guy is amazing. What should we do? We should make him our king. And what's Jesus' response in that moment? He slips away. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm not going to be king on your terms and in your, during your timetable. I will be king on my terms within the scope of my timetable. And in this moment, it's time. It's time for Jesus to march into Jerusalem and declare that he is king. He knows that he is king. So not only does Jesus receive what they're saying of him, he's also fulfilling certain prophecies that were said about him. So there was something known as messianic expectations in the first century world of the Jewish people. They are awaiting their Messiah. They have been awaiting their Savior. And the Old Testament created a certain measure of expectations of who this person would be, what he would do, and what he would be all about. And so there was a variety of expectations, but by and large, almost everybody expected that the Messiah, the Savior, would be from the line of David. He would fight a decisive battle that would defeat the evil empire, and he would then establish his kingdom in Jerusalem that would span to the entire earth. And so some of those come from the Old Testament. There's this continual refrain through the Old Testament about the line of David and the house of David and the Messiah being a part of the lineage of David. They were expecting that the Israel people would finally experience freedom and peace and that God would set up an eternal kingdom 
on earth. Now, not only is Jesus fulfilling some of these expectations, but he's also fulfilling a very specific prophecy from Zechariah 9. We read this in verse 14. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written, a reference to an Old Testament prophecy. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming seated on a colt. Now, when you go back and you read all of Zechariah 9, this passage, which is like verse 9 through about verse 12 or so, you see this image portrayed of a victorious king coming back from battle. It says that he comes in righteous and victorious. It talks about him like kind of destroying certain war um, weapons of chariots and horses, saying he's breaking those from different parts of the nation. He's establishing himself strong and powerful. He's bringing and declaring and proclaiming peace to the world, and he's releasing prisoners and captives. He's setting them free. And so basically, this is what the Jewish people are wanting. They're wanting peace. They're wanting to be able to be their own people, to have peaceful citizenship and be free from Roman occupation. And so Jesus comes, and they're placing all of these expectations on him. And at some level, he does receive it. And he does show that he is fulfilling certain prophecies. However, at the same time, he's doing it maybe in a way that they are not expecting. Meaning Jesus does fight a decisive battle against evil. But instead of doing it on the battlefield that happens on the cross, he is going to establish his eternal kingdom on earth. But it's not going to happen right then and there in that moment. He is a descendant from David. He is the new and better king that David could never be, a king to which David's reign points. And he's saying, I am all of these things, but what I'm doing is something different than what you're expecting, and I'm doing it in a different way. Because when you step back and you read all of Zechariah 9, and you read all of verse 9, you see that there's one verse that does it, or one word that doesn't make it into John's gospel. As New Testament writers quote the Old Testament, sometimes they take liberties and how they reframe things, right? That would have been Hebrew and they're writing in Greek or Aramaic. Sometimes they maybe drop a word here or there, or they rewrite something or they paraphrase something. For whatever reason, John drops one word from Zechariah 9. That actually does appear and I think Matthew and Mark's version of this story, but it's the word lowly from Zechariah 9, because this is what we read in Zechariah 9, 9. Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and victorious. He is a victorious king, but he's lowly, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus comes into Jerusalem as a gentle lowly, humble king. There's all of this fanfare. There's all of this hype. The crowds are anticipating a revolution. But Jesus comes in a different way, framing the whole episode, not in light of power and prestige and victory, but as meekness, humility, and gentleness. And what's interesting about this passage is that you have three distinct groups that are referenced in this passage. There there are the crowds who are just overcome and lost in the hype of this moment, waving palm branches, shouting, save us now, believing that Jesus is their king who's going to march into Jerusalem and overthrow the Romans. Then you see the religious leaders who are frustrated by this because it says in verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Since the beginning of John's gospel, the Pharisees have wanted Jesus gone. They've wanted him to be removed from Israel. They've plotted a plan. They've devised a plan to kill him. And this just confirms for them, we need to get rid of this guy. And they are frustrated by the attraction of these crowds to Jesus. But you also have the disciples in this moment. You see the crowds getting lost in the hype. You see the religious leaders frustrated. And then you see the disciples miss the point. It says this in verse 16 about the disciples. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. 
I mean, they don't know what they're looking at. They don't know how to make sense of who Jesus is, which is really fascinating because they spent three years with this guy, had meals with him around the dinner table, traveled with him from one town to another, had sometimes special instruction that was reserved just for them, got to see firsthand the miracles that he performed. But yet still, even in this moment, It says they don't fully understand. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Which makes me wonder, did the disciples in this moment get swept up in the hype of the crowds that they missed what this moment communicated about Jesus? Because if entrances communicate something specific about the person who's entering in the moment that they're in, what this moment communicates about Jesus is that he is king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of the entire universe. And what comes with that is the respect and the honor that's due to him. Sometimes we want Jesus to be our friend. We want Jesus to be our, our, our buddy. Do you, do you remember like these t-shirts Back 10, 15 years ago, Jesus is my homeboy and Jesus has given a thumbs up. Like we want Jesus to be our buddy or we want Jesus to be our sugar daddy who's going to do things for us and dole out favors and goodies if we're on our best behavior. We sometimes perceive Jesus in this way and what this moment shows is that Jesus is king. He's the one who created all things. It says that all things are from him and for him. They're to him, they're through him. Like he is the master of all things, everything in this world belongs to him, and we should give him the respect and the honor that's due his name. Becky and I were watching um, this week a show called Designated Survivor. It's from, I don't know, five, six years ago. Anybody familiar with this? There's, it's a show where, like, there's a bombing on, I think it's on the Capitol building during some sort of, like, presidential ad- address, and everybody in the Senate, everybody in the House is killed, and they have this one guy who's kept in a secret room in case there's a tragedy like that, he immediately becomes the president. And he's a guy who's just gotten fired from his role as like the housing secretary or whatever. But immediately, because he's now the new sitting president, honor is given him. Respect is given him. Everybody refers to him as Mr. President. Yes, Mr. President. Like Jesus has that same honor bestowed upon him. He is the king of the world. And sometimes we lose sight of just who he is in being the king. Now, this moment, though, says something about who he is as king. And I think sometimes we get swept up in the hype of our world that we, too, lose focus about just who Jesus is as king. Because what we're fixated on when it comes to people in positions of leadership, is the power that comes with those positions. The prestige that might come, the influence that might come. But Jesus, while he is king, he's a different sort of king. He's a king who comes not wielding power, not using force, not trying to inspire intimidation and fear or try and build up his stature and prestige. Jesus comes in riding on a donkey. Not a stallion or a steed or a chariot. He comes in riding on a donkey. And like Zechariah says, he is lowly. Some translations say he is humble. Some translations say he comes in gentle. So Jesus is king, but what this says about him and who he is as king is that Jesus is a gentle king. Jesus is gentle. And what's really fascinating to me about this story is that Jesus doesn't say anything in this passage. Like he's there, and there's all of this hype around him, but he's, he's present in the midst of it, not trying to push anything, not reinforcing anything. He's receiving what they're saying about who he is as king, but he's a very different king than people perceive him to be. And sometimes a very different king than who we want him to be. 
So the question is, what does this mean for us? And what I wonder is whether or not what we can offer the world in the balance of 2024 that might make a dramatic impact in our world is the gentleness that Jesus displays in this moment. You can imagine that the political climate of Israel and Jerusalem in that moment is thick. They're tired of being oppressed by the Romans. They want freedom and peace and prosperity again, and this is the guy who's going to get it, and we're going to ride into Jerusalem, overthrow the Romans, and set up shop once and for all. The political climate in the first century was thick. The political climate in America in 2024 is thick. And you better believe that in the next few months, we're going to see the worst of America come out. Because when power is on the line, and people have the chance to win, they will do whatever it takes to win. They will bulldoze people, they will sling mud, they will call people names, they will do all of this just to have a chance to win. Because our world looks to politics to be our saving force. And unfortunately, people in the church today also look to politics to be our saving force. And what Jesus continually demonstrates for us is that he is our saving force. So if the crowds are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, if the crowds are shouting, save us now, Jesus rides into Jerusalem saying, that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm bringing salvation. It just looks a bit different than you're expecting. It doesn't look like an overthrow of a government. It looks like a guy riding on a donkey, being hailed as king, but not demonstrating massive power plays. And if we can embody the gentleness of Jesus in our sphere of influence, we have the opportunity to make a lasting impact that can turn heads, that can catch people's attention, that can point them to Jesus in a way to say, he's our true hope. Jesus, all throughout his ministry, demonstrates repeated gentleness. And we too have the ability to be those people who demonstrate that as well. Now the question is, how do we become those people? How is it that we become people of gentleness that catch people's attentions? Because sometimes we perceive gentleness as weakness. We perceive it as something that demonstrates that we don't know what we're doing, that we're not worth looking at, and that we're just going to be run over too. But I think there's an incredible amount of strength that can be portrayed in gentleness if we understand how to harness it. And so the question is, how do we become those people? And I think the first thing that we do is we actually resist the desire for power because we realize that through the Spirit and Jesus in us, we already have power. We have supernatural power. We, it says in Ephesians uh, 1 that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in you. So you don't need to clamor and go after and try and grab power. You already have it. So that gives you the ability to live into it in a different sort of way. The other thing that you can do is be present to certain moments. I think it's fascinating, again, that in this story, Jesus says nothing. There's not a word that is uttered from Jesus' mouth as he rides into Jerusalem. But he is wildly present to the moment. Some of the most influential people in my life who have made a lasting impact on me, have been people who are both gentle and present in gentleness to moments where I have been an idiot. So when I was in high school, I had a younger brother, and we were always like egging each other on, as brothers do, challenging each other, daring each other to do stupid things around the house. And one day, my younger brother challenged me to pull a prank on my mom. My mom. And, of course, like, I did it. I was like, oh, I'll take that challenge, hands down. I pull this prank on my mom, and it totally hurt my mom. Not physically, 
but emotionally. She was mortified. She was like, how could you do that to me? She felt disrespected. So as a little punk 18-year-old, I did the prank and I ran away. Um, and then a few minutes later, like I went to check in my mom, like, hey, mom, it was a joke. And there was all of this emotion, like streaming from her face. Like, how could you? My son, why would you do this to me? I can't believe this. And I was like, oh, that was not good. And then I ran away again to like hide and let things cool down. And then after, I don't know, 30 minutes or so, I kind of like sheepishly walked down the stairs and my dad is sitting on the couch. My dad is a, is a man who embodies gentleness. And in that moment, he could have marched upstairs, kicked in my door, grabbed me by the collar, reamed me out, pulled me by the ear, taken me back down to my mom and said, you will apologize. But instead, he just parked himself on the couch, and he just, he just waited. He waited till I came down the stairs, and he just said, hey, come here. And he said, you did this. I was like, yeah. And he's like, you know that hurt your mom. I was like, yeah. And he's like, you know what you need to do, right? He said, yeah. And I went and apologized and worked it through. And again, he could have responded wildly different. But he knew that in that moment to come alongside me, to be present to the mess that I made and not have to escalate it was going to have a greater impact on my life than if he were to exert the power that he had as my dad and force me to apologize. Gentleness has strength to it when you're present to the moment in people's lives. Not only does Gentleness has strength when you're present, but it also has strength when it comes with perspective. When you have perspective, specifically that people are more important than power, or people are more important than progress, or people are more important than different ideals that you have. So uh, last month, our family was in New Hampshire. I was speaking at a camp that I grew up going to. It was a very significant place in my life growing up. It was one of those places where God used the ministry of that camp to call me to be a pastor. And so over the last handful of years, we get the privilege of going back there and speaking at this camp. And there's a guy named Dave who was there both when I was on staff there and who is still there, who's been there for like 30 years, a staff member there. And he's this like ginormous guy probably like 6'6, six, six, just big guy. He's the maintenance guy, which you anticipate maintenance guys are like tough, rough guys, and they're just like fixing, you know, engines and like throwing tools around and like bench pressing trees, you know, just like these guys have like blisters everywhere on their body from working really hard. But Dave, I'll never, was the most gentle of giants at this camp. One day we were like, it was the week of getting camp ready for everybody to show up and open up, and I'm like mowing a lawn or whatever, and I had this lawnmower, and I ran over a handsaw. Like, why it was on the ground, I don't know. Somebody probably it fell out of their toolbox or whatever. You would think that I'd be looking where I'm mowing and be able to see that there's a saw in the grass, and I should stop. I run over it, and the way that I realized I ran over it, because it made this sound that you would anticipate a lawnmower would make as it runs over a saw, and it was just, you know. So then I was like, ah, so I pulled it back, saw what I did, tipped over the lawnmower to kind of see what was going on with the blade, just kind of like step back. And I don't know anything about lawnmowers or the engines of lawnmowers, but there's all this oil from one compartment of the engine that got into another compartment of the engine. And after I realized what I did, I picked it back up and I was like, well, let's see if this thing starts. And I go to pull the cord and like black smoke goes poof everywhere. And I have to call Dave and be like, Dave, I ruined the lawnmower. It doesn't work. The blade's going to need to be replaced because I ran over a saw. And you would think that he would like lose it on me and he would freak out. He came over and he was like, well, that's not good, is it? <laughs> and wildly gentle with me in that moment because he knew that this was a learning moment for me more so than anything else. And when we demonstrate gentleness and understand the strength that we have in our gentleness, it catches people's attention. It has the ability to make a significant impact in their lives and can impact them for who knows how many years to come as they think about the encounter they had with us. 
Because everybody in our world is like characterized by anger and rage, like all the time. And when we can be people who are different, which gentleness is one of the fruits of the Spirit, it catches people's attention, and they realize that there is a different way to live in the world. And that's what Jesus is demonstrating in this moment. As he's walking into Jerusalem, he's saying, I am king, and I do have a kingdom that I'm establishing. It's coming in a very different way, not through power and force, but through sacrifice, humility, and death. And when you're able to see that and take hold of that, it unleashes a supernatural strength in your life that can change everything about your life. And so Jesus is demonstrating he's gentle. We said at the beginning, this entrance communicates something about who he is and what it means for us. It communicates that he is a king who's a different sort of king that's marked by gentleness and that we are people who have the ability to embody that gentleness in our world to make a lasting impact for generations to come. So may you see that Jesus is king. May you know that he is a different sort of king and a different sort of leader and a different sort of ruler than any king, leader, ruler, president, or politician who will ever set foot in office. And may we have the courage to become the type of people that Jesus calls us to be. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus' example. We thank you so much for what he does on the cross and how he leads us in a completely different way. Lord, I pray that we, unlike the disciples, would be able to see it in the here and now, and we wouldn't have to wait for time to pass to look back, to have our eyes open, but in this moment, we would be able to see who you are, what you're about, and how we are called to be people who initiate change, not through force, but through service. We love you, Lord, and pray this in your name. Amen.